Hello again, folks. It's David Muller, and we are reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This is chapter three, Edmund and the Wardrobe. Now, in the last chapter, Lucy had discovered Narnia, and she has just returned from Narnia for the very first time, and she's been there for hours. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, chapter three. Edmund and the Wardrobe. Lucy ran out of the empty room into the passage and found the other three. It's all right, she repeated. I've come back. What on earth are you talking about, Lucy? asked Susan. Why, said Lucy in amazement, haven't you all been wondering where I was? So you've been hiding, have you? said Peter. Poor old Lou, hiding, and nobody noticed. You'll have to hide longer than that if you want people to start looking for you. But I've been away for hours and hours, said Lucy. And the others all just stared at each other. Batty, Edmund said, tapping his head, quite bad. What do you mean, Lou, asked Peter. What I said, answered Lucy. It was just after breakfast when I went into the wardrobe and I've been away for hours and hours and had tea and all sorts of things have happened. Don't be silly, Lucy, said Susan. We've only just come out of that room in a moment ago. And you were there then. She's not being silly at all, said Peter. She's just making up a story for fun, aren't you, Lou? And why shouldn't she? No, Peter, I'm not, she said. It's, it's a magical wardrobe. There's a wood inside it, and it's snowing, and there's a fawn, and a witch, and it's called Narnia, come and see. The others did not know what to think, but Lucy was so excited that they all went back with her into the room. She rushed ahead of them, flung open the door of the wardrobe and cried, now, go in and see for yourselves. Why, you goose, said Susan, putting her head inside and pulling the fur coats apart. It's just an ordinary wardrobe. Look, there's the back of it. They all looked in and pulled the coats apart, and they all saw, Lucy herself saw, a perfectly ordinary wardrobe. There was no wood and no snow, only the back of the wardrobe with hooks on it. Peter went in and wrapped his knuckles on it to make sure that it was solid. A jolly good hoax, Lou. He said as he came out again, you have really taken us in. I must admit, we half believed you. But it wasn't a hoax at all, said Lucy. Really and truly, it was all different a moment ago. Honestly, I promise you. Come on, Lou, said Peter. <laughs> That's going a bit far. You've had your joke and you better drop it now. Lucy grew very red in the face and tried to say something, though she hardly knew what she was trying to say and she burst into tears. For the next few days, she was very miserable. She could have made up with the others quite easily at any moment if she could have brought herself to say that the whole thing was only a story and made up for fun. But Lucy was a very truthful girl and she knew that she was really in the right and she could not bring herself to say this. The others who thought she was telling a lie and a silly lie too, made her very unhappy. The two elder ones did this without meaning to do it. But Edmund could be spiteful, and on this occasion, he was spiteful. He sneered and jeered at Lucy and kept on asking if she'd found any other new countries in the cupboards all over the house. What made it worse was that these days ought to have been delightful. The weather was fine, and there were uh, out of doors from morning to night, bathing, fishing, climbing trees, and lying in the heather. But Lucy could not properly enjoy any of it. And so things went on until the next wet day. That day, when it came to the afternoon and there was still no sign of a break in the weather, they decided to play hide and seek. Susan was it, and as soon as the others scattered to hide, Lucy went to the room where the wardrobe was. She did not mean to hide in the wardrobe because she knew that it would only set the others talking again about the whole wretched business, but she did want to have one more look inside it. For by this time, she was beginning to wonder herself whether an Arnia and the fawn had not been a dream. The house was so large and complicated and full of hiding places that she thought she would have time to come in and have one look at the wardrobe and then hide somewhere else. But as soon as she reached it, she heard steps in the passage outside and there was nothing for her to do but to jump inside the wardrobe and hold the door closed behind her. She did not shut it properly because she knew that it's a very silly thing to shut oneself in a wardrobe, even if it's not a magic wardrobe. 
Now the steps she heard were those of Edmund, and he came into the room just in time to see Lucy vanishing into the wardrobe. He at once decided to get in himself. Not because he thought that it would particularly be a good place to hide, but because he wanted to go on teasing her about her imaginary country. He opened the door. There were coats hanging up as usual and the smell of mothballs and darkness and silence and no sign of Lucy. She thinks I'm Susan come to catch her, said Edmund to himself. And she's keeping very quiet in the back. He jumped in and shut the door, forgetting what a foolish thing this is for him to do. Then he began filling around for Lucy in the dark. He had expected to find her in a few seconds and was very surprised when he did not. He decided to open the door again and let some light in but he could not find the door either. He did not like this at all and began groping wildly in every direction. He even shouted, Lucy, Lou, where are you? I know you're here. There was no answer and Edmund noticed that his own voice had a curious sound, not the sound you expect in a cupboard, but the kind of an open air kind of sound. He also noticed that he was unexpectedly cold and then he saw a light. Thank goodness, said Edmund, the door must have swung open on its own accord. He forgot all about Lucy and went towards the light, which he thought was the open door of the wardrobe. But instead of finding himself stepping out into the spare room, he found himself stepping out from the shadow of some thick, dark trees in an open place in the middle of a wood. There was a crisp, dry snow under his feet and more snow lying on the branches of the trees. Overhead, there was a pale blue sky the sort of sky that one sees on a fine winter day in the morning. Straight ahead of him, he saw between the tra tree trunks, the sun just rising, very red and clear. Everything was perfectly still, as if he were the only living creature in the country. There was not even a robin or a squirrel among the trees, and the wood stretched as far as he could see in every direction. He shivered. He now remembered that he had been looking for Lucy, and he also, how unpleasant he had been to her about her imaginary country, which now turned out not to have been imaginary at all, he thought. And then he must be somewhere quite close, so he shouted, Lucy, Lucy, I'm here too, it's Edmund. There was no answer. She's angry about all the things I've been saying lately, thought Edmund. And though he did not like to admit that he had been wrong, he also did not like very much being alone in this strange, cold, quiet place. So he shouted again, I say, Lou, I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I see now that you were right all along. Do come out, let's make a pact. Still, there was no answer. Just like a girl, said Edmund to himself, sulking somewhere, won't accept an apology. He looked around him again and he cited, he did not much like this place. And he had almost made up his mind to go home when he heard, very far off in the wood, a sound of bells. He listened, and the sound came nearer and nearer, and at last there swept into sight a sleigh drawn by two reindeer. The reindeer were about the size of Shetland ponies, and their hair was so white that even the snow hardly looked white compared with it. Their branching horns were gilded and shone like something on fire when the sunrise caught them. Their harness was of scarlet leather and covered with bells. On the sleigh, driving the reindeer, sat a fat dwarf, who would have been about three feet high if he'd have been standing. He was dressed in a polar bear's fur. On his head, he wore a red hood with a long gold tassel hanging down from its point. His huge beard covered his knees and served him instead of a rug, but behind him, on a much higher seat in the middle of the sleigh sat a very different person. A great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. She also was covered in white fur up to her throat and held a long straight golden wand in her hand and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar. Except for her very red mouth, it was very beautiful face in all respects, but proud and cold and stern. The sleigh was a fine sight as it came sweeping toward Edmund with the bells jingling and the dwarf cracking his whip and the snow flying up on each side of it. 
Stop, said the lady, and the dwarf pulled the reindeer up so sharp that they almost sat down. Then they recovered themselves and stood, champing their bits and blowing. In the frosty air, the breath coming out of their nostrils looked like smoke. And what, pray, are you? said the lady, looking at Edmund. I'm, I'm, my, my name's Edmund, said Edmund, rather awkwardly. He did not like the way she looked at him. The lady frowned. Is that how you address a queen? She asked, looking sterner than ever. I, I beg your pardon, your majesty, I did not know, said Edmund. Not know the queen of Narnia, she cried. Ha, you should know better hereafter, but I repeat, what are you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I don't know what you mean. I'm at school, at least I was. It's the holidays now. Tune in next time for chapter four. Chapter four is called Turkish Delight.